everybody. I'm meteorologist Jordan Steele. The official high today, 70. Wasn't it nice? Many spots in the 60s. Wanted to give you some comparison across the country. Eee, triple digits in Vegas stretching to the south in the desert areas. The uh, Lone Star State, very warm as well. In fact, most locations on the map are in the hot category. Now, tomorrow, these are tomorrow highs now. We're looking to warm up a bit. I think it's going to be nice. But just to give you some perspective, this is where you want to be. It's going to be fantastic going into the next... 24 to 48 hours. So here's a look at highs around the northwest interior, uh, around the San Juans, around the ocean areas, upper 60s, mid to upper 60s, with some low to mid 70s, the further inland you get. So sound areas, let's say from Linwood, Seattle, pointing southward into Bellevue on the east side, you got that low to mid 70 mark. Next story basically for the south sound. Clouds in the morning, sunshine in the afternoon. You might get some sunshine early on, but it's going to be the cloud sun game tomorrow, okay, as we transition out of this pattern, and uh, it even looks pretty darn nice out along the coast, so we are looking good for tomorrow, if you're curious about what's happening this weekend or even next week, I'll be back in a couple minutes to talk more. Okay, Jordan, thank you. So new tonight, the city of Sammamish has closed Pine Lake Park Beach after tests showed high levels of bacteria. King County is going to test the water again Friday and Monday, and if it comes back acceptable, the earliest the beach will open is the 28th of August. The last parts of the viaduct are starting to come down, if you can believe it. Uh, it's a bit of a juggling act, though, for construction crews able to reopen one street, but then they're forced to close another, all in the name of progress. The latest closure is at South Jackson Street. King 5's Amy Marino is there tonight live. Amy, this one kind of surprised some people heading home from work tonight, didn't it? Yeah, I think people were a little bit caught off guard. Now, keep in mind, imagine this morning you came to work and you either rode your bike or you took the ferry and you headed up South Jackson Street, no problem. But when it was time to come home from work, well, things looked way different out here. By the end of the workday, fencing cut off South Jackson Street, turning this thoroughfare into a dead end, much to the frustration of drivers, walkers, and bikers. I'd say it's been a little bit of a hassle. It's, it's kind of a different part of the maze every single day. The street became a sort of traffic jam, U-turn route mashup. <laughs> These tourists were trying to make their way to the waterfront. The GPS brought you down the street? Yeah. <laughs> That's great being there. Well, thank you, Seattle. Ferry riders will need to give themselves extra time in the coming weeks and utilize Alaskan Way to try and catch ferries at the Coleman Dock. Yesler Way and South King Street are now back open to help people get through. Cyclists will have to maneuver around all the action, knowing they might go to work one way and go home a different way. Every day it's a new adventure. And removal of the viaduct started back in February. It's going to take about six months, and there's going to be plenty more of these closures to come. Now, some people today were caught a little bit off guard just because the DPS didn't immediately register this closure, and it didn't immediately register the opening of the other streets nearby. So when these situations happen, you have to keep in mind that right away some of these closures don't always catch up with the GPS on your phone. So just be aware and look out for those road closure signs and the detour routes. For live tonight, Seattle, Amy Marino, King 5 News. All right. Almost 10 acres and cost hundreds of millions of dollars will house more than 15,000 employees. Scientists believe that they can teach computers to visually recognize developing hailstorms by using a program similar to facial recognition software. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen with our sister station in Denver explains how that has brought a new level of artificial intelligence, or AI, to weather forecasting. AI is now everywhere. It's, it's on your phone, it's, on, it's driving the air, everything on your social media page. David John Gagne, a scientist with NCAR, is using what he calls machine learning, or training a computer to forecast severe weather. We're interested in looking at ways to be able to give people an alert that hail might happen within the next day or so. It's artificial intelligence, like facial recognition systems. Teach a computer what your face looks like, and it can automatically identify you the next time it sees you. So teach it what a hailstorm looks like, and it can spot it in computer modeling, giving a forecaster an alert that hailstorms may be coming soon. Part of the idea with this tool is, is to make it easier to drink from the data fire hose because there are so many different models that come out every hour or every day. Gagne trained his machine by showing it images from NCAR's vast archive of storm data. They're kind of a kidney bean shape, 
or it's another one looks more like a cashew. I call this the, the bow echo storm. The really bad thunderstorms will look similar because it's a similar wind shear pattern that creates and ventilates the strong updrafts responsible for dropping large damaging hail. Gagne verified the computer's learning ability by running the model backwards, asking it to produce what it thought would be the perfect hailstorm. In one case, the machine produced a situation where a small supercell merged with the larger one, which is interestingly enough exactly what happened with the storm that produced Colorado's new record hailstone in Bethune last week. Meteorologists across the country are starting to take notice. I've been able to convince a lot of them that this is, is quite a viable thing, and, and now there's been a huge explosion in meteorologists wanting to do their own machine learning on different problems. This technology can also be used to analyze storms on radar in real time and on visual satellite images. So Jordan, is that the toughest part of, of predicting Crazy. weather is taking the massive amount of data that you have and trying to figure out what's relevant? Yeah, so the thing that's going to be unique about this is when you get a model, the computer is not going to know whether the model is 100% accurate or not, right? And so it's going to take time for it to learn all that. And that's why, you know, there's several models out there that we look at. And we're like, okay, well, this one's obviously not allowing for this feature to be uh, associated with it. Yeah. So that Exclusively in front of unique about this is when you get a model, the computer is not going to know whether the model is 100% accurate or not, right? And so it's going to take time for it to learn all that. And that's why, you know, there's several models out there that we look at. And we're like, okay, well, this one's obviously not allowing for this feature to be uh, associated with it. So therefore, we know that this forecast is probably going to be wrong. And we're going to know that this forecast is going to be right. So it'll be interesting because it's just going to pop out like, you know, hail here, hail here, hail here, hail here, hail here. When the reality is there's only hail here. Mm. So I'm wondering how many false readings they'll have, but it's interesting. I mean, we're in that yeah. age of data and technology. So for now, we still need people like you. For now, <laughs> that's right. You're still in business. I still have a job. That's exactly correct. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that develops, though. Okay, let's get back to home. We no hail today, just some rainfall. Very nice. In fact, some spots on the coast, I wish a coastal bound, almost an inch today. Uh, that was definitely one of the bullseye spots. Everybody else picked up less or fewer amounts than that across the board but very healthy given the time of year so a look at western washington data plot here this will show you rain amounts all across the region and the highest amount shelton i want to point you out at about a half of an inch and uh whatcom county picked up a good amount same thing for the coast out at quail and forks so for SeaTac specifically for the whole month we're above the inch mark this is the monthly average so we're looking above normal yet again and uh, it's looking pretty decent. Now, temperatures have been very cool today. Several of us got stuck in the 60s, and we stayed there. Now, throughout the day tomorrow, we'll warm back up into the 70s. And believe it or not, I think we will eventually be back to the 80s before we know it, and summer will continue. But we get, we're going to take some time to get there, okay? So currents tonight look good. Window open. I think we'll fall into the mid-50s for a lot of us. A couple showers still out there. Okay, this is Tacoma. There's Federal Way. Notice it's got that line between Tacoma and Enumclaw. We've got a couple of showers there, and really that's about it across uh, much of the sound and actually technically across much of western Washington because the line, the front itself, is now well out into eastern Washington. Had a couple of lightning strikes over the Blue Mountains. That is now working its way in the Idaho Panhandle. On the back side of this is what we have coming our way for the future. So therefore, tomorrow, we'll start off with low cloud cover. I think we'll uh, mix all of that out of here and get into some sunshine by the afternoon. Temperatures look to climb back into the 70s. We'll pretty much keep it into the 70s for the weekend. The unique feature for this weekend is going to come right there. So that system is going to stay to the north. However, it's got a pretty long front associated with that. And as that moves closer to Vancouver and Victoria, we might see some of that work its way closer to home by Saturday afternoon. So we'll keep a couple of showers, mostly cloudy skies definitely for Saturday. And then after Saturday, we'll go through this process of drying out, higher pressure building in. All the storms will stay to the north. There's the rotation going around it, and therefore that's going to create what we call an offshore flow, a warming trend, and of course more sunshine. So notice we're back in the 70s. We also have a chance for maybe a couple showers and mostly cloudy skies for the weekend. It's technically Saturday. And then next week, look at Tuesday, look at Wednesday, mid, maybe upper 80s. So summer has not gone anywhere. We've just got a really nice slice of fall today. All right, Jordan, thank you. Coming up, fall is just around the corner, and soon young athletes will be on the football field. We have a new way to protect them. A story about that against concussion next. And welcome back. 18 years after the murder, the first charge is filed in the killing of Seattle federal prosecutor Tom Wales. An indictment was unsealed yesterday, charging an Everett woman in this case. 
Chris Ingalls has been tracking this story since the day it broke, that crime on Queen Anne here in Seattle, and reports on the new developments in the case. This is the Snohomish County home where we think Shauna Reed has lived since at least February. No answer today, and no response from Reed to this indictment unsealed yesterday. It says that suspect number one in the Wales killing had bragged to her about suspect number one's involvement in the murder of a judge or lawyer when interviewed by agents in 2017. But charging documents say she made false material statements six months later in front of a grand jury when she denied making those statements to agents. The charge, obstruction of justice. Suspect number one may be the man Wales prosecuted in a fraud case in 2000. This is Tom Wales after a hearing in that case. The charge was dropped months later, but agents have long theorized that the target of that investigation, a Bellevue pilot, held a grudge against Wales, who was murdered the following year in 2001. Uniquely, the pistol that was used as a murder weapon. Since that time, the FBI launched one of the most intense investigations in its history, but had not charged anyone until this week. There's no explanation for how Shauna Reed is connected to whomever killed Wales in the basement of his Queen Anne home. Her lawyer would not shed any light on that today. Kevin Peck said only, she has pled not guilty. We look forward to demonstrating in court that she's not guilty. So we really don't know much about Shauna Reed. We don't know about her connection to the suspect or why this suspect, who's been under such an intense FBI investigation for 18 years, would say these words to her. Again, her lawyer will only say that she's pled not guilty and she is due in court next for a trial that is set for October. I'm Chris Ingalls reporting. Well, tonight, tonight I know Mayor Wayne Fournier is facing a criminal assault charge after a female bartender says he slapped a phone out of her hand. Uh, police say that surveillance video shows what happened July 28th at the Chenino Eagles Club. A female bartender says that a group of men refused to leave, so she picked up a phone and threatened to call police. That's when she says a man slapped the phone out of her hand. When security told him to leave, the man started yelling, Do you know who I am? I'm the expletive mayor of Chenino. The incident has people talking.